Good morning. I love having the first session in the morning because it, you get a mix of two groups, right? You get the group that is ready to go, and you get the group that's going, where's my coffee? So um, I hope you're on the spectrum in there. You've already got in there. Um, SVP of Cloud Operations, um, little, little typo there. That was what they originally suggested my title become, and it ended up being global operations. The reason being is we were at a six-year drought in California, and I didn't want somebody to think I was responsible for bringing clouds into California. Because at the time, 50% of the public thought cloud computing was literally in the sky. So this morning, I want to spend a little time sharing some stats and information with you as we've spent a lot of time looking at what your life looks like in, in the day of a CIO or a leadership in the IT stack. And we realized that as we were building our product, your role was transforming. And we wanted to share some information on that. And speaking of roles that are transforming and kind of future predictions on that, how many people in this room remember the flying toaster screensaver? All right, keep your hands up if you ran it. Okay, I know that's good. Yeah, I saw some young people still had their hands up. They don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, that was written by Berkeley um, in 1989. It was released for Mac in 1991 for Windows. Now, the neat thing about it is flash forward to today, and what is Elon Musk shooting into space by the dozens? Flying toasters, small little satellites that are gonna provide global coverage for broadband in there. So um, the, the, the guys that built that um, at Berkeley actually uh, sold that off to another company, and they actually became the founders of moveon.org, which ironically was the result of the Clinton impeachment for everybody to move on. So really weird play of politics and technology, but here we are today, Right again, we're going to put satellites all over the world and, and have global internet back in the day when I had a hard time getting a clean line to get into AOL. So this is pretty interesting in there. CIOs today are not the technologists we were 25 years ago. I remember when I started my career, all I had to do was bring in a computer, a program, a spreadsheet. If I automated something or did some screen scraping, I was a genius, okay? Boom, give that guy a promotion, he gets more money, throw some people at him. Does everybody remember those days? Yeah, those were the good days. And then what happened? My budget grew, everything else. They moved me away from the CEO and put me right under the CFO. And the first thing the CFO looked at me and says, boy, you better tighten that belt before I do. And so then the CIO role is all about contracting expenses. So we started doing this weird set of governance on people, you know. You will use this computer, you will use it for five years, and you will not break it. The keyboards are standard, the mice are standard, the everything was standardized, and everything else like that. And then lo and behold, the democratization of devices came out, right? People started bringing in their own mobile devices. I remember that was the Blackberry revolution. I remember our policy at the company I worked at the time was we would not allow the exchange accounts to be attached to, to BlackBerry. And I looked, at, I looked at the guy running that group and I said, well, why not? Because I, I'm using one. Is it some kind of everything else? And he goes, oh, it's a security problem. It's a security problem. Well, notice where that particular software ended up on the security list. It was one of the better pieces of secured software out there. We're probably less secure on some of our mail today. But the democratization of devices, I feel, led to a little bit of a problem. And this is what I call the anarchy of applications. So the fact that your users can download anything they want, port a lot of your company data into it, and start running a rogue process in a business, I think is fundamentally altering how we think of those, those things going on. And by the way, when I say think about things going on, What's going through your head right now? Probably every one of these words that I'm putting up here on the screen, this is your life. You're being pulled into hundreds of directions out there, not to mention this thing we call digital transformation, which is really its own list of 100 things to do. Um, but I, just real quickly here, this is just to check to see how the coffee's working. How many of you are concerned about one of those words or working on a project with one of those words right now? Coffee's working, good job. All right, 
yeah, this is what we're looking at. This is real busy, right? And we, look, we took one of the companies that was looking at that anarchy of applications, and by implementing an application that really solved all of their business needs um, in terms of uh, multiple apps for communications, in our, our, our specific instance, they retired 29 other rogue apps in the company. So the average company now runs about 1,000 apps in the cloud, and, and they want to run around 300 apps is about the normal optimized route. So you've got 700 to get rid of. If you can take out 29 of them, that's a pretty big deal, right? That's kind of how we look at it. So what are CIOs now paying attention to the most? Okay, we talked about the life of a CIO a minute ago. First of all, it was give them money, they'll do, it, they'll do magic. Then it was shrink the budget, right? Get IT under control, get it smaller, slim it out, get cost in control, do thin desktops. Those things are gonna go forever. We, we, that was what I thought of, of my CEO at the time. He just wanted to go back to VAX terminals. He didn't really understand what a thin desktop really was. But really, the CIO's role today is you're on the hook for bottom line revenue. Um, technology is no longer just powering the inside of the company. It's powering your relationship with your with your customers, with your employers, with, with your actual product, with the ability to deliver and support and scale and interact and become a trusted brand. So we talk about here is the second part of this role is customer experience. There's no CIO today that sells a product either B2B or B2C that it doesn't have a responsibility for a piece of that customer experience because customers don't interact on paper anymore. It's kind of gone. I remember when we went to the, it was a really exciting day for, for me. Um, Ring Central got listed on the New York Stock Exchange a little, over, uh, a little over six years ago. And we got to go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange for the bell ringing and everything else like that. And I remember growing up just reading about these hand signals on how to do stock trades, and I wanted to see that so bad. And this, you know, these secret ring down lines they have on the floor that I'm asked by trading companies to support on VoIP systems and things like that. And I'm like, this is gonna be the day. I'm gonna see the most important ring down phone in my life, the one on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange on bell opening on our IPO day. And they don't do that anymore, everything's electronic. They bring a guy out that's about 80 years old that still remembers the hand codes and he does the first couple of trades and writes them down in the book and go, here you go, gives you a copy of it so you have that little memory of that working and everything. He never once touched the phone. I almost picked it up myself because I just wanted to see if it worked. But uh, uh, customer experience is digital now, it's all on the technology stack. But the new one in here is employee experience. Employees don't want to work at dodgy companies that don't have a solid technology foundation in which to do their job. And they're a little bit lost. They are flooded every day with different ways to do things. And they come in with a social experience that says, oh, well, I can have WhatsApp for the parents and my overseas family. I can have uh, my local dialer for spam calls. I can have... Uh, a, a, you know, I've got Apple iPhone messaging, I've got all these different ways to talk to people, mingle with people, Facebook can keep going on Messenger. I can keep track of that because most of the time I only have a couple hundred people that I interact with on a friend, social, or familial level. So the average, it's something called Dunbar's number, says you can only track about 100, 150 relationships in your head. Well, I can remember which app they're in when I'm doing that, right? That's pretty easy, 150, that's not hard to keep track of. The average worker needs to be able to maintain, this is non-customer uh, call center worker, so an average knowledge worker needs to maintain 2,500 business relationships. They LinkedIn, they over here, they over here. You can't keep track anymore. You don't remember where that person is. You need a unified capability underneath that. So who's thinking about this? So 49% of CIOs say they're on the hook for revenues all the way to the bottom line. So remember, that's not just pulling dollars in the door. That's kind of the old school of what you had to do. You have to pull dollars in the door that actually drive margin and get all the way to the bottom of the line. You have to grow, grow the actual business on there. The next piece of this is the customer experience. 55% 
say that they are on the hook for driving the customer experience inside their business from a technological standpoint and sometimes even beyond that. So CIOs have always been somewhat involved in that behind the scenes technology, but now they need to be in front of customers as well. They need to understand how their customers plan to interact with their business. And the last one, the one probably surprised me the most, 58% said that they are on the hook for the employee experience inside the business. Now I get this because of, you know, at least in my career, I've run help desk for almost 30 years. And um, everybody knows if you get a help desk with a rating above one, it's not really a help desk. But we know the, we know the jokes that go with help desks and supporting on those. But this is really about employee productivity. What applications are we using? What are the line of businesses doing? And how do they make their decisions and make sure that they get the software and support that they need without creating a vertical silo of information, of data, that you have to then burn resources on translating or mapping to other sources or making available in other departments. So we know one of the major issues today is how much time and effort the CIO organization spends building and maintaining integrations between these cloud apps. It can be a drain on resources if they're not done right out of the box. And unfortunately, it's guys like me that come out here and also talk about the future of AI. And, you know, we finally have enough compute power to do trained ML AI at a pretty decent scale in almost every business. But if your data is scattered all over the place, your line of businesses are making independent judgments on their applications and the CIO is not driving that employee experience, then you might have a lot more work to do than the value the AI pays off for. And I'm finding that to be, unfortunately, a little more true than I think the industry had hoped um, on that front. Now, I think there's more exciting things coming in AI just other than the math and trained ML sets, but that's where the bulk of AI is today. Look, being blunt here, the rules of how you talk to your customers have completely changed. Okay, the old rule was this. You print it at the bottom of your receipt or you put in your terms and conditions. If you want any help from me, if you want help from Curtis, I've got an 800 number or I've got a mail address or I've got some other, you know, very specific form of communication. You must send something to me and I will reply to you and let you know whether I will support it or not. Okay, I don't think anyone here in this room understands why that model is so dead um, that, that, it, that it couldn't possibly be revived, period. And the new model is this, and I'm only gonna use this example to make the example simple. There's nothing wrong with Nike. So anyone working with Nike, please don't send me hate tweets. I'm not picking on your company, I love your company. Um, I wish you made big shoes for runners, but you don't, so I have to buy your basketball shoes, but that's really my only beef, okay? So Nike has today, one of their users gets a pair of sneakers and they have a bad experience out there and they tweet, screw Nike, this, these shoes are horrible. That's a customer interaction. That has to be gathered in, that has to be responded to. Well, what's wrong? Well, your shoe's defective, we'll replace it. We're Nike, that's what we do. The shoe's $3, you pay $200, and we'll give you another $3 pair of shoes. It's not complicated for us. We're a brand and image company and, and, and we're a lifestyle company, but if you're not super happy with that product, we gotta do it. So that's just a tweet. What if they call, what if they email, what if they post in some other social? What if it's a closed circle somewhere? What if it's information you're a little bit blind to and a secondary source says, hey, look what happened to my friend. Are you able to walk back that customer interaction from two stages away of your core client, get to that client and solve their issue? The real thing is that the customers are dictating how this is being done today. How many people in here run a call center or a contact center for outside customers' business or consumers one way or another in your business? How many people have you had those? How many of you, keep your hands just for a minute, 
How many of you can take a WhatsApp call right now in that call center? We have one hand, that's good. Is it WhatsApp? <laughs> All right, so look, you've got to be able to do this multimodal out there. And here's, here's the stunning number that's associated with it, although I think it's pretty, uh, uh, pretty obvious where, where it comes from. 90% of your customers, business or consumers, say, you have to deal with me the way I want to now. Don't print the terms at the bottom of that receipt anymore. I can call you, I can email you, I can social you, I can do any of those other things. You need to be able to engage me. And by the way, when you engage me, I may want to change formats. See, I might tweet that I had a bad experience, but when you ask me for my receipt number or you ask me for my credit card number, you know, tweeting that out may not be a great idea. So I want to change modes. I may want to do that over a private phone call or in a private chat. Maybe I want it in a secure chat, some other type of uh, Apple business messaging is a pretty good secure chat platform. So we have to think in terms of customer experience as well. And this is just driving into one small area of our business. Our businesses could be uh, involved in this in supply chain management, it can be in the retail front, it can be in the business front, it can be in any of those particular vectors out there. How are we supporting customers in there? All right, so let's talk about the new one that's on board, right? So employee, employee experience. How many people do you think are probably working from home today on the, in this globe? we call Earth. The estimate right now is a little over 1.2 billion. 1.2 billion, okay? Um, unfortunately, it's probably largely currently uh, expanded by the coronavirus scare, but 1.2 billion are working from somewhere other than their office today. So I am going to assume, for sake of argument, everybody sitting in this room believes they are working even though I saw some of you at some party places last night. I'm not going to call out names or point out people. Um, but since we are working, we're not obviously in our offices right now. We've been doing this for a while, but now everybody expects to be able to do this. So CIOs and our technology and then our group's technology that we ran in IT and everywhere else so people could work from a lot of places because we needed that you know, that router expert had to be a reachable on the weekend in case something went down. We put technology in place to make him a valuable asset off the clock. Now we have to make people valuable assets on the clock, anywhere they might be. Now, for most network engineers out there, this becomes daunting. Because my applications, my data, my customer information, is now flowing through the Starbucks Wi-Fi, which we all know is remarkably secure. Um, it's not, in case you ever want a demo of that, there's a great YouTube video, I won't do it myself, but uh, I, I tell you to take a look at it. So we talked about this problem earlier where our personal communications, we understand those relationships, 500 or so, um, tops, usually 100, 150, no more than 500 personal relationships. I can remember where I communicated with them. Business world, that 2,500-ish range, that's too many to remember which channel I was into. So what's happening is people are wasting a ton of time trying to remember which system I'm supposed to go into at my office in order to look up sales information, customer information, or some other piece of information. So a survey we conducted a couple years ago said 69% of workers were switching between 10 or more apps a day for business, and that context switching was costing them up to an hour. That's stunning to me. That's a massive loss of productivity, but that goes back to that anarchy of applications uh, conversation we had. But look what's going on in a typical day. Days aren't the same anymore. You don't sit down in front of one console and a desk phone and do your job for eight hours. Things change a lot. This is my day. You know, a little look at a theoretical version of my day. I don't drink coffee, so the Starbucks might be a lie, but the, the changing modalities 
interweaving modalities, doing multitasking, going back and forth between meetings, email, messaging, collaboration, video, chat. This is the world and how we work today. And, and I know you recognize this because you're like, yeah, that's what I do, except I have about 20 more lines in that. And then the graphic designers wouldn't do that because you couldn't read it, uh, read it anymore. But yeah, this is your employee experience. What are you doing to make sure, one, that experience is good enough to retain those employees, have them be productive in their businesses, and the second one is, what are you doing to keep control and be able to mine that unbelievably rich data set that exists in all these forms of communication for your business? If they're lost in apps, you don't have domain control over the data, then that's information you might be losing out on how to target customers better or how to even currently in today's unemployment world, target and retain employees better. The typical person that's exiting their 20s has had seven jobs. Seven jobs. And this is the new generation, so that's not because they're necessarily living in our basements. But the seven jobs is because the economy is booming and they can go to where the experience is best. This one I found really surprising. So we talked about this employee experience, this EX, and employees that have choices where to go. By 2021, Gartner believes that CIOs and their organization will be co-equally responsible for the culture with the HR department of their company. Okay? And the reason that surprises me is I did, I did some business school and I distinctly remember not caring about the HR classes. Um, we just needed Bs to kind of, you know, check those off and get on there. And now I'm like, wait, I'm now co-equally responsible for the culture of my company? How did this happen? This technology drove this, the device, the application, the absolute permissiveness of having a computer in your pocket that surpasses anything we could have thought of just 30 years ago in terms of compute storage and memory and edge AI and all the other functions, camera, digital space on the screen, network capabilities almost anywhere in the globe, even flying at 38,000 feet. That's a game changer. How we leverage that really makes a huge difference in how, how the culture of a company works. What is your culture in your company? What is it supposed to be? Do you have a culture of always on? Your employees should be accessible anytime, anywhere, always. Do you have groups of employees that should be able to rotate their always on time? Do you give people digital breaks? Do you have a way to manage a digital break? Can you have somebody literally stop calls and texts and messages and everything else for three or four days so they can take a digital break or maybe it's their digital break weekend? How many of you just heard the term digital break for the first time? Okay, it's one of the top trending terms in under 25 year olds when they're discussing where they might take a job. And if you're co-responsible for the culture, you gotta start thinking, well gee, Am I the CIO that provides tools and access for my company to have a digital break? Is that a part of our DNA? How are we going to support all of this? So if you're not thinking what we use in the terms in the CI world, stage three and four technologies, technologies that are tightly integrated, that have broad uh, support in the, in, in the company between multiple lines of businesses. If you're not thinking in terms of a robust stage three or four capability, you're not gonna be able to drive culture inside the business because you're gonna be fighting the fires of silos and during that time. So I believe one of the key tools in this is being able to really provide a rich experience along how workers communicate and share and talk to each other. Hence why I've chosen the profession that I've been in for almost 27 years. 62% of workers say they're in double or more of the virtual meetings they were in a few years ago. 
That makes sense, right? If we go back in the meeting world, we kind of had super specialized meeting worlds. They weren't very good experiences. The TVs were small, the cameras were super expensive. Took an hour or two to set up a meeting. Um, they were always pretty much exclusive to board or sea level. And then came out these super fancy rooms, right? They had 3,500 degree Kelvin lighting. They had massive high definition screens. You, camera placement was very specific. Microphones was very specific. Brought that meeting connect time down, right? Wasn't multiple hours to set up. You didn't have to have a video person coming in that had a camera and wired to the room. And those rooms were out there, but they were a room that was booked for an exclusive group of the company. And we democratized all of this technology and now you can buy 4K cameras built into your laptop or a Chromebook for 300 bucks. Everywhere's a video room now, right? Your desk is a video room. It can be uh, small huddle rooms. It can be anything along those lines. But we are hearing from these now that it's not as smooth as we want it to be. Joining online is still a challenge. It's not instant. Average meeting now starts only seven minutes late. It was way worse before. We brought it down to seven. There's room to improve. The next thing on there is meetings aren't really scheduled as much anymore. People want to be able to do them ad hoc, so they can't be fighting tech issues with rooms or cables or things along those lines. Nine out of 10 workers admit. The other one, by the way, is a liar, okay? So nine honest people, one liar, that they're doing something else while on virtual meetings. I would say about five out of 10 do things in real meetings that are, are, are not part of the thing in there. But what surprised me is what they're doing, dealing with tech issues. Number two on the list, they need to get work done. Aren't they working in the meeting? When are we gonna get smarter on who should be in a meeting and who shouldn't be in a meeting? When are we going to get some insight into that video and that technology, that data set, exposing the data inside media streams and being smarter on that? We're really close, and I think we've got answers in there. Last one, the topic's not relevant. You need to just get out. So 67% of the workers want something seamless to do. This makes sense in here, including team messaging and meetings, because in meetings aren't the source or the main event anymore. It's what happens before the meeting, the collaboration on the content, the setup of what the decision is to be made or the information to be presented, the narrowing of the participants, the exact list of, of what we're trying to accomplish, not trying to accomplish, you know, kind of gone are the days you build an agenda. But you go through this collaborative and iterative process, usually in messaging and file sharing and things along those lines. Then you have a meeting, it's live in real time. It's live discussion, it's real time editing, it's things along those lines. And then you've got this post meeting experience. Most meetings you don't walk, well that's done. Mark it off the calendar, I never have to think about it again. There's action items, there's follow ups, there's other things going on there. And in a lot of cases there's yet another meeting to go. But you've gotta have those two things connected or it's almost impossible to keep track of that. It's impossible to keep your employees or your customers engaged in that process without multimodal connection between those. It's my last, last stat here is 84% also believe that the most important thing inside of a video meeting is actually crystal clear audio. That's because if I were standing up here right now and you just saw my lips moving but you couldn't hear me, it wouldn't be a very good experience and that would be a live example of that. Um, so, you know, note to, note to all of us out there, we've got to be able to do this on any device, in any mode, from anywhere, yes, airplanes. I um, hope we don't do conference calling on airplanes yet, but, you know, you've got to be reachable, right? From the cloud, and I think we all know why it has to be from the cloud, because you can't build every network in every location. As we mentioned before, it has to be easily integrated, already out of the box. If you spend all your time on integrations, you've lost that battle. You're gonna be stuck there and not in enabling your customer experience, your employee experience, or increasing your bottom line. And we're more and more global. We work from home. We open sites and we close sites. 
the last piece on here is if you're taking a look at a communication platform, I invite you to come take a look at what we do because this is how we think of your problem. We think of it as the entire pie, that there are all these forms of communications, they have to work together, they have to belong to you as an industry, and we have to meet customers where they are, and we have to provide a platform for employees that they enjoy working in, and they can get their jobs done anywhere in the world, anytime, any device. So if you have an opportunity, our mission is to make this easy for you and easy for all that want to be able to partake of it and come visit us at 1425. I really appreciate your time this morning. Thanks for hanging out with me. Hope you're well through your first round of coffee. Thank you.